Okay, Civil Rights Movement Part 2 for the 1960s. We left off, we were speaking about Malcolm Little, aka Malcolm X, uh, and some of the opposition that he provides to King. We're going to get to a little bit more of that right here. Now, again, to reiterate what we see in the Civil Rights Movement in the 50s and the 60s up until this time, we see successes in the court. For example, turning back segregation in Brown versus Board of Education. We talked about the Freedom Rides, interstate travel um, is desegregated. There is some success in integrating the schools in the South. It's uh, piecemeal progress, but it is progress nonetheless. There's major legislation that has been passed. Um, now, we'll get to the Great Society down the road, but one of the two main parts of the Great Society was uh, ending racial discrimination. Uh, Johnson wanted to end poverty, and he wanted to end racial discrimination. Um, civil rights was a key part of the Great Society. Now, was part of this because of his Southern guilt? Um, was part of this because he had seen this as a teacher when he was younger, how uh, unequal the treatment was? We don't really know his motivations. We know what he claims. We know what his biographers claim. But it, race was a major part of Johnson's presidency and trying to affect change in a positive way. So we'd see two major pieces of legislation. First, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which banned discrimination in the workplace based on gender or race, prohibited racial segregation in schools, employments, and public accommodations. Now, this was one that Kennedy wanted to pass. He was working on it before he was assassinated. We can give Kennedy some credit for that one. Uh, but it passed when Johnson was president, and that is a whole other issue. Johnson's ability to get legislation passed when he was president, he was an excellent politician. Uh, another thing we see is the Voting Rights Act. This ended discrimination uh, in voting. Um, uh, and, for example, it outlawed the literacy test. It made it possible for federal officials to verify uh, that these elections were coming off equally and that race was not being used to deny people the vote. So there is some significant progress, yet for some this was not sufficient and it was coming too slowly. As the nation officially welcomed equal treatment, getting old, sorry, welcomed equal treatment and equal opportunity, there were still some incidents which drew outrage. Um, now, for some, the right to vote was considered the last great civil right. Once it was achieved with the 1965 Voting Rights Act, or I should say um, solidified, because of course the 15th Amendment, which came during Reconstruction, also uh, guaranteed the right to vote regardless of race, but that of course we know um, southern states were able to get around that. But again, the Voting Rights Act would clear that. And so once this uh, provided this quote unquote last great civil right, um, there was some drifting away from the movement, especially among whites. Um, this is similar to abolitionists uh, after Civil War, after the Civil War, after the Thirteenth Amendment. Slavery is ended. Some drift away toward uh, focusing on the rights of African Americans or providing true equality. Now, King led uh, somewhat of a transition to a focus on economic rights, and in some ways, he did tip his toes, uh, dip his toes in the socialist waters. Um, quote, we need massive programs that will change the structure of American society so that there will be better distribution of the wealth. Uh, this was from a speech of his August 1st, 1965. And again, this was part of Johnson's great society. He provided job training, vocational training. He provided better educational opportunities. There was a lot that Johnson did to try to put forth these programs to help redistribute wealth, if not directly, at least indirectly. Still, though, there's growing reticence among some regarding King and his methods. Adam Clayton Powell, for example, told King to stay off his turf in Harlem. Um, and Adam Clayton Powell was an, a very important, uh, influential, powerful civil rights leader in New York. Leaders in Philadelphia were reluctant to work with King. Again, they thought he was too slow, too naive. And there's growing frustrations in the cities. Even in the North, uh, in 1959, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights called Chicago, quote, the most residentially segregated large city in the nation. And Chicago, of course, is in the North. Many felt marginalized even after all this legislation, even after all these changes as far as desegregation. And there is considerable high unemployment as well as underemployment, which we'll get to a little bit more. Now, one of the things that we see come up in the 60s are riots. Riots. 
what was behind these riots. For the most part, it was often a direct issue uh, or an episode of police brutality coupled with the authority or the courts lacking decisive action or punishment of those who committed the brutality. So step one might be the police officer inflicting violence on a young African-American male, but what really set people off was when that police officer was then let off, uh, when nothing happened to him uh, for his actions. And obviously when you get to the 80s, um, you see, and then the 90s with Rodney King, we see this uh, obviously led to him a huge riot. But this is what, again, what leads to many of these riots. Now that's the direct, uh, that is the trigger really. But there are other issues that come into play. African-American leaders often pointed out the economic issues, unemployment, underemployment. Uh, black households' average income was only slightly more than half the income of white households at this time. Um, there is unemployment for uh, African-American youth. Oftentimes, their unemployment rate would be substantially higher than whites of the same age group. Another issue that you see uh, or that was claimed was a lack of recreational options. There was nowhere for black youth to go at night, especially in the summer. Um, I started to write uh, my first thesis on, uh, on uh, well, African-American history in Omaha with an emphasis on the riots in the 60s. There were riots in 66, 68, 69, somewhat in 67 as well. In 70, we see some violence as well. But for many of these local leaders, they point to this, that African-American youths had nowhere to go. At night, they have nowhere to go. And I mentioned, especially in the summer, and the summer is when we often see these riots. Hot nights, um, nothing for folks to do, etc. cetera. Uh, and there would be racial upheaval or riots in over 150 cities from 1964 through 1967. So this doesn't even include the Martin Luther King riots. Uh, in 64, uh, in July, in Harlem, a white police officer shoots a black youth, touching off riots. Rochester, New Jer Jersey City, Philadelphia, we see similar incidents in 64. In 1965, we have what's called the Long Hot Summer. Uh, August 11th, in Watts, Marquette Fry is pulled over by a Los Angeles police patrol. A crowd assembles as Fry is asked out of his vehicle. The officer draws his gun. The crowd erupts in anger. Um... We see a repeat situation in Watts, many uh, such as this around the country. Many felt the police treated them with excessive force, felt they were marginalized economically. African-Americans were turned down for jobs in the neighborhoods where they lived by whites who often migrated into the city um, from their suburban homes. Uh, so they would have these shops, but rather than hire the people who actually lived there, um, they would hire different people. Uh, there were overcrowded living conditions, run-down apartments, etc. Fry's arrest, in particular, would provoke five days of rioting, looting, and burning. The governor of California ordered the National Guard to maintain order. In the end, 34 people were killed. Property damage was estimated at $40 million. King went to L.A. to try to calm the tension. He was booed. He was heckled. Um, again, these activists or these rioters, however you want to look at them, disruptors, were not happy with the way the civil rights movement was going, and they felt that there was no tangible improvement on there for them. Um, in Newark, July 12th through the 17th, 1967, a similar fracas would lead to 26 deaths. July of 1967 in De Detroit. Now, Detroit was considered a model city. Uh, there were African-American representatives in Congress. There was a sympathetic mayor. Significant funds from the Great Society were pouring into the city for jobs and training of African-Americans. But... Many believe the police force was abusive. Uh, it was mostly white. There was also a significant segregation of this northern city, especially after the interstate was built. Now, this divided neighborhoods, and it made it so those driving to work downtown didn't need to drive through or in these neighborhoods to get to their workplace, so they weren't aware of much of the, um, well, the emaciated nature, really, of these areas. Uh, there were claims of underemployment in the auto industry. Uh, African Americans often got the worst jobs at these. And of course, Detroit, that's what people are employed in, is uh, the automobile industry. There were even divisions within the black community. Uh, as strong civil rights organizations supported King and nonviolence, while black nationalists had developed and gained momentum. There were claims of an interracial couple being prevented from moving into a Detroit suburb. A black Vietnam veteran had been killed by a group of whites. On July 23rd, 
Uh, much of this came to a head. There was a gathering to welcome home two African-American Vietnam veterans at a place called the Blind Pig, which was an unlicensed bar. Police raided the club early in the morning, setting off five nights of violence. Why? Well, 82 were arrested. There were claims of excessive force. The crowd gathered through empty bottles into the rear window of a police car, a waste basket thrown through the storefront window. More police were called. They are struck with stones, bottles, and other objects. Even John Conyers, a congressman, was pelted with bricks and bottles. Firemen came to put out the fires. They were increasingly subjected to attack by rioters. The National Guard is finally brought in. Looting is rampant. Gunfire begins to take the lives of many store owners began to shoot looters um, one while he was struggling with the police some by sniper fire there were complaints uh, from the policemen that um, they could not determine the origins of the gunfire so they just shot back even paratroopers were ordered in by lbj in the end 33 african americans were killed 10 whites were killed almost 1200 people were injured over 7200 people were arrested in the end Property damage was estimated at $32 million. This would be the largest urban uprising of the 1960s until King's assassination and its after effects. Um, so you can see here with this Detroit situation, again, this is considered a great city for African Americans, but there is quite a bit of tension. And then the police raiding this bar, um, which leads to direct violence between two groups, um, store owners shooting looters, police officers shooting people, etc. Uh, it's awful. The Kerner Commission was established by Johnson to examine the causes of the rioting. The six-month study concluded the source of the problem was white racism, that the United States was increasingly moving toward two distinct societies, one white, one black, and it recommended social spending programs on housing, job training, and welfare, and uh, not coincidentally, these were all parts of great society reform. But the Kerner Commission's conclusion uh, is quite interesting because you have here by 1968 significant legislation, significant change that had desegregated the nation. Uh, but this commission of experts actually would tell the opposite. Now, riots weren't everything. Of course, there were assassinations. We uh, in June night, June fifth, nineteen sixty six, James Meredith was ambushed and shot as he attempted to complete his march from Memphis to Jackson, Mem uh, Mississippi. He was the first African American enrolled at the University of Mississippi, if you'll remember right. Um, this attempted assassination, of course, uh, upset the African American community. Snicks, Stokely Carmichael, and Coors Floyd McKissick would go to see Meredith. When they met with him, they decided that his march must be completed. As they walked through Mississippi, they saw that little had changed, regardless of federal legislation, regardless of Freedom Summer, regardless of all the efforts by young whites, young blacks, the government, etc., by federal entities, they realized that very little has changed. Locals in Mississippi harassed them, and the police continued to turn a blind eye, or they would even arrest the activists as the troublemakers. Soon thereafter, thereafter, at a mass rally, Carmichael would intone, quote, what we need is black power. The crowd would go crazy. The phrase became the new slogan for many in the civil rights movement. Um, as mentioned, uh, Carmichael literally wrote the book on black power. He has a book called Black Power, which very much gets into the details of what he and many of his cohorts believed was necessary. Um, there was a sense that African Americans needed to feel a sense of racial pride a sense of self-respect. They had to find those first before they could do anything else, uh, before anything else could be achieved. They encouraged strengthening of black communities without the help of whites. And in many ways, whites were turned away from these groups, kicked out um, or denied entry into any of their meetings. Um, because again, this is a separatist group for the, essentially, they felt that they needed to make change on their own. They needed to find their own economic self-sufficiency. Now you can go back to Marcus Garvey in the 1920s. This was something he believed was necessary. And somewhat ironically, Richard Nixon would also espouse this view that economic self-sufficiency was necessary. When we get to how uh, Nixon dealt with domestic issues, we will focus more on that. But rarely do you hear Stokely Carmichael and Richard Nixon in the same sentence as agreeing on something. But again, this uh, 
very much told of the evolution of the civil rights movement. There was a repudiation of racial, racial integration. Uh, the alliance with white liberals um, was ended. Tension had always been present. Um, and part of this was because for many, they believed if an African-American was killed, no one would care. But if a white was killed, then the nation would take notice. Unfortunately, we can look at this today and see many of the same realities. Um, one example, I had mentioned Mississippi burning in the previous uh, video lecture. These three kids who disappeared in Mississippi in June of 1964, um, these three kids disappear. Uh, one was white, and really that's what led to the federal reaction of trying to find them. Um, SNCC and CORE both began to reject white membership. Each would abandon the concept of peaceful resistance. King and the NAACP would denounce this, but it didn't matter. As I mentioned, SNCC would go on. Uh, no longer were they the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They were now the Student Nationalist Coordinating Committee. African culture now began to celebrate, uh, now began to be celebrated by many, uh, particularly African American college students. They wore traditional African colors and clothes. Women donned the hairstyle of Africans. James Brown, of course, sings, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Black is beautiful becomes another chant among African American youths. Um, again, this is what black power was about. Black power wasn't about hating white people necessarily. Certainly there was probably some of that, but it was about focusing on African Americans. And again, it gets to African culture, African practices, uh, and recognizing that African music. And then you get to African American music and you see the uptick again of folks like James Brown. Later on, you see it with hip hop and soul a little bit as well. Sam Cooke was a noted civil rights activist. Um, some argue one of the reasons he was killed was because of that. Um, but again, there is more of a conscious effort to focus on African background and African pride. One other group worthy of mention, of course, is the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. This was the original name of the party. Um, of course, when I was a kid, I heard how awful, how violent Black Panthers were, and indeed they did espouse violence when it was necessary. But the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense did many important things. Um, first of all, just to give you an idea of what why the self-defense aspect they took to the streets uh first in oakland then in other cities uh they would take weapons guns into the streets to take control of their neighborhoods in an attempt to minimize police brutality um so again they're not going into these communities looking to shoot police officers they're looking they go in with these guns in groups to defend their people to hopefully prevent such actions of police brutality. Chapters of the Black Panther Party would open up all over the country, even in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, when we look at what the Black Panther Party did, I mentioned they go into these communities to defend them, but they also did many other things. They had free breakfast programs, they had free lunch programs, they provided free daycare, they provided educational programs for different kids, um, they helped in Head Start, they contributed in many ways. It was not just a violent group of kids looking to cause problems. They did productive things in their communities, and again, in communities all over the United States. There are many noteworthy Panthers uh, that are worthy of mention. Um, Bobby Seale and Huey Newton were the two creators of the Black Panther Party. Again, they started it in Oakland, but we, and Bobby Seale would actually, his autobiography is a great piece of American literature. He would actually go on to teach in, uh, Ivy, uh, one Ivy League school. I can't remember which one, but he never let go of his feelings, of course. Um, and Newton would actually be the first, uh, Panther who would be shot by the police. Others include Bobby Hutton, who was the first, Panther to be killed by the police. Um, Eldridge Cleaver, a noted writer. Um, his work, Soul on Ice, is a classic. Fred Hampton led uh, the effort in Chicago. Uh, if you look him up, uh, he and his partner uh, were gunned down in their apartment on a police raid. Um, some of the images are the bloodiest images you'll ever see and very disturbing. Um, literally shot in his own bed. Those are a few. Now, one last thing I want to leave you with, because this, I mentioned the good things that the Black Panther Party did, uh, that um, they helped the community in many ways. I also want to point to what was very much their credo in one statement. Political power comes through the barrel of a gun.
Some of you are familiar with Mao Zedong, uh, the little red book. This came from that, and they did actually also promote um, handing out these little red books, so there was a little bit of communism involved. But political power comes through the barrel of a gun. Again, they recognize the need that if you have to use violence to make change, then that is what you need to do. It is not that they went out and looked for it, but they went out to defend the community, to help the community bring itself up. And in this way, again, we do see some sense of separatism, an increased sense of militancy. But for many of these people, again, they felt that the civil rights movement under King had simply not done.